תודה רבה. תודה רבה לחבר הכנסת דוקטור אראל מרגלית. אני מזכיר שאחרי הקטע הבא אנחנו נצא להפסקה וזו ההזדמנות של כל החברים שנמצאים פה להיפגש עם אותם החברות שיובילו את ישראל להיות מעצמת סייבר עולמית. כשתראו את הטכנולוגיה שלהם תבינו זאת. ואני ללא הקדמה נוספת רוצה לעבור ולהציג שני אנשים. הראשון הוא ג'ו לונסדייל שהוא פרטנר בפורמיישן 8 והוא הקו-פאונדר של פלנטיר. זה כבוד גדול מאוד לנו שהוא הגיע לארץ להיות יחד איתנו ואני גם מקווה ומאמין שאחרי שהוא יראה את החברות בארץ הוא גם יחליט להשקיע בהם וקרן אלעזרי שהיא סייבר סקיוריטי אקספרט אני אציג אותה ממש במהירות. ג'ו לונסדייל נתחיל עם האורחים מחו"ל. ג'ו לונסדייל is a partner at formation 8 a fund which invest in companies solving hard problems in large industries and connect them with ASEAN conglomerates in order to give innovation a global impact. Before that Joe co-founded Palantir Technologies, a multi-billion dollar software company which develops mission-critical analysis systems used by government and financial organization around the world. He is also the founder of Adepar, a leader in private wealth management technology. Previously, he worked with the financial arm of PayPal while still a student and then joined as an early executive at Clarium Capital and was a key player in growing Clarium into a five billion uh, AUM global Marco hedge fund. Joe has a variety of philanthropic pursuits. He is chairman of One, Home, One Hope, a charity focused wine brand with partners such as Mondavi family, whoever likes wine knows them, and serves on the board of uh, CACS.org. מי שתראיין אותו, ואני מיד אזמין אותה לבמה, זו הגברת המוכשרת קרן אלעזרי, שהיא מומחית אבטחת מידע, חוקרת ומרצה, עמיתה בסדנת יובל נאמן, אישיות צעירה אבל מוכרת מאוד בתעשיית אבטחת המידע וההקינג בישראל, עבדה בחברות אבטחה, אבטחת מידע מובילות, גם בארץ, גם בארגונים ממשלתיים ובחברות גלובליות, ועוסקת בקידום טכנולוגיות חדשניות בתחום אבטחת המידע. כיום היא חוקרת בסדנת יובל נאמן את השילוב בין מרחב הסייבר, מודיעין, פוליטיקה והמלחמה המודרנית במסגרת תואר שני במסגרת תוכנית לימודי הביטחון של אוניברסיטת תל אביב. אני מתכוון להזמין, אני מתכבד להזמין לבמה את מיסטר ג'ו לונסדייל ואת הגברת קרן אלעזרי ואחרי כן נצא להפסקה קצרה שבה תהיה לכם הזדמנות נהדרת לפגוש את האנשים הצעירים והמוכשרים היושבים פה איתנו בתחום הסייבר. Hello, can you hear me? Fantastic. Before we get started, I thought this could be a fantastic opportunity to explain the concept of a fireside chat. As Joe was uh, uh, remarking earlier, here in Tel Aviv we don't really need a fireside chat. It looks like we need something more like an ice side chat. But for those of you not familiar with the concept, the fireside chat is quite popular in California and Silicon Valley. And the idea is to have a more informal conversation. with an exceptional individual, a visionary, and in this case, a very bright entrepreneur who has managed to grow his business and become very, very successful in this industry, in the cybersecurity industry. So we're going to have a short discussion, and I'd like to get us started by hearing from Joe, if you could tell us a little bit about the story of how you founded Palantir, and what sort of big problems were you seeking to solve with technology? Sure. Thanks, Karen. It's, it's an honor to be here, everyone. Um, so Palantir, as you mentioned, it's a large company that works you know, about 17 countries now and running a lot of their defense technology and cyber technology. Um, you know, if I'd known Dr. Yaron as a mentor ahead of time, I might have started outside of government because it turns out more than half our revenue comes from the Fortune 500 now, which is right, are much better customers than governments. But the reason we started Palantir was after 9-11, we saw the U.S. government was spending tens of billions of dollars on their defense IT and cyber technology. And frankly, the best engineers in the U.S. were not going into that area. Israel has a really neat advantage here where everyone goes through you know, the, the army and they have really smart people in 8200 and other groups. The U.S. doesn't have that. The, the best people in the U.S. actually really don't want to work for the military. And so they had a big problem. And my, my friends and I had been at PayPal, and the challenge at PayPal was that the Russian and Chinese mafia were stealing like $7 million a month from us, and it was a very unprofitable business. And, and about seven of our competitors went bankrupt, and we figured out how to stop uh, the mafia through a variety of systems we built. The, one of the key high-level insights, which is very relevant for cyber as well, 
is it's not just about teaching the computer how to stop the bad guys. It's also about building systems that allow analysts to see what's going on. And so really combining, here's what people are better at, here's what machines are better at, and using the machines to put the data into a conceptual form that people can understand. And so we, uh, you know, based on that experience and based on seeing the government really wasting huge amounts of money on bad technology, we were inspired to get a lot of the best engineers in Silicon Valley together and build Palantir. And, you know, it, it, the thing we're most proud of at Palantir is I guess we started about 10 years ago and it's best known for having the strongest engineering team in Silicon Valley. It's still ranked number one for the strongest engineers. And I think that's, that's a big part of why it's been able to do what it did. Definitely, and uh, for those of you not familiar with Palantir, the company has been growing uh, significantly. It's now evaluated as a multi-billion dollar company, relying on that strong engineering core in San Francisco, but also on the value that they provide their, their clients, uh, whom I might add are mostly in the government and financial sector. So that kind of leads me to the next uh, question, that is, what kind of problems are you seeking to solve now with the companies that you're investing in, that you're looking at around the world with your new endeavor, Formation 8? Sure. So, yeah, so I, so I started a couple other companies after Palantir, and a lot of my friends are building companies, and so I started a fund to invest and help them. And the, the, the big thing you're seeing right now coming out of Silicon Valley and, and other places is, is what a lot of people refer to as big data. Basically, you know, if you go back 30 or 40 years and say, what, what were people building in technology 30 or 40 years ago? They were mostly building a lot of enterprise systems that run the big industries. And so when you go into a city bank or you go into a big healthcare organization, a lot of times you're seeing systems from like 1979 or the 1980s. And for the very first time now, you're starting to have to replace those. And the reason you have to replace those is because suddenly there's exponentially more data and you have knowledge workers and they're trying to ask questions and solve problems. And they really just can't do that with, with, with the old systems that are there. So you know, for a while, people were very focused on consumer technology. But a lot of the best people now are focused on these, these big data systems for big industries. And, and that's actually some very similar problems within the cyber and defense space now being applied to energy and, and health care and, finan and you know, finance and retail and all sorts of areas. So it sounds like big data is big business. And there's a lot of opportunities coming down. Uh, with Processing big data, identifying patterns and very large amounts of unstructured information, etc. So coming on to that, how do you see the next wave of security innovation technologies? Do you envision it coming out of Silicon Valley or rather uh, maybe here in the neighborhood of Tel Aviv? Yeah, well, I, I definitely think that, that Tel Aviv is going to be if, if, if either the global center or one of the top few global centers for, for security technology. I mean, it's, it's, you can interpret it how you'd like, but even during the PayPal battles with the Russians versus the people in Palo Alto, it, we, we discovered it was actually Jewish people on both sides, both trying to steal money from us in Russia and trying to defend from them in Palo Alto. So maybe, you know, that's probably why we're in Tel Aviv right now talking about these problems. Absolutely. <laughs> So, but but but, but uh, I mean, there's there's there's, there's a lot. Uh, there's, there's too many themes in security to talk about all of them. One one interesting theme, again, it goes back to extending human intelligence versus versus just trying to build automated systems. So you know, you've seen a lot of the commercialized cyber technologies focus around kind of perimeter control and like detecting opportunistic attacks and you know automatically trying to figure out what's going on. And and that's gone to be pretty advanced. I, I think a lot of the new stuff that's really interesting is how do you get people to understand what's happening? Because you, if, you, if you're in a big corporation, you have scarce resources, and you have an attack, and let's say you're at a big bank, it's going to be a very different response if the attack is like the Russian fraudsters probing you to try to get access to your transactional systems and to steal your money, versus it's, it's the Iranians who are doing a DDoS and just care about taking you down because that's their job. And just really understanding deeply what the attackers are doing, who they are, what their motivations are, ends up becoming really important. And so, and so being able to empower your teams to see what's happening is, is a different sort of thing in security that, than just automatically stopping opportunistic attacks. Definitely. And we've been hearing a lot about intelligence-driven computer defense operations, for example, is really focusing on trying to solve those problems. Who is the adversary and what are they trying to do? Now, speaking of companies that are trying to develop technologies in that space, would you say, or would you give some advice for Israeli security startups in this space? Should they go with the government, be a part of accelerators, or perhaps move into the lean startup model and start prototyping very quickly and come up with solutions for the market? Definitely. Well, I'm a big fan of a, of a lot of different Israeli companies and also an investor in one of the funds up there that's doing cyber stuff. So I, I think there's a lot of awesome stuff going on. You know, one, 
there's, I mean, not to make generalizations, there's, there's a lot of different challenges, obviously, people here face. One thing that's interesting is I think Israel is probably the best in the world at the actual substance, at the actual technology. It's not always the best in the world at the brand or the business. And, and that's kind of something where people just roll their eyes. It doesn't matter. Like, let's just talk about the innovation and the problem. Um, and it's true. I care most about the innovation, too. But you, you can imagine these conversations between the Israeli entrepreneur and the, and, and the guy at the Fortune 500 company. And, 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 you, and the Israeli entrepreneur just gets really frustrated and says, but it's the best. And why don't you know what we're doing? And you, oh, you guys are stupid. And, and, that, and that's unfortunately not very helpful for business, where you, you actually need to spend a lot of time investing in branding and in business strategy. And frankly, forming the right partnerships with people that will give you the right brand. Because the unfortunate thing about security, and this is something I don't like about the security market in a business sense, it's not always the best technology that wins. It's oftentimes the best brand that wins. And if you're selling to people who aren't smart enough to be able to tell what the best technology is, that's, it, it's tough, right? So, so, so you have to spend a lot of time thinking about how you get people to know that you're the best, how you get people comfortable with you. Um, and especially in the U.S. government, which is the highest defense spending in the world, unfortunately there is, I've noticed, a lot of anti-Israel sentiment and a lot of nativism, which is very difficult to deal with as well. So being able to have the right partnerships and come in with the right high status people and really being smart about business strategies is, is a critical thing that I think the Israeli tech ecosystem is still, still learning how to do better. So alongside technical innovation, don't forget the business aspect side, don't forget the marketing, don't forget the branding. I think those are important points. Thank you for that, Joe. And as we come to kind of the last question that we have time for today, what would you say are the key lessons, one key takeaway lesson for Israeli startup trying to make it big in the global security industry? Should they focus on American government and defense? Should they start here locally in Israel? Should they target the worldwide market? What would you say? Well, I think, I think Dr. Yaron was, was, was right. I think the bigger market is with the big banks and the big commercial organizations. And I think, I think the key thing is you want to, you know, I, I guess the, the key thing is you want to get the very, very best people all working together. There's way too many startups, I think. Everyone wants to have their own. I think if you can combine forces, get people working together, have a really strong proof of concept here and prove it out, and then get the right partners and go after the big banks and the big organizations in the U.S., that, that, that's how I'd go about doing it. Fantastic. All right. Uh, I think that's some fantastic advice. Just to summarize it, don't forget uh, business, don't forget marketing, partner with the right companies, look at the broader markets out there, including financial sector, big enterprises, and that there's a lot of innovation coming out of both Tel Aviv and Silicon Valley. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Joe. Happy to have you here.